Это первая, первая в общем, такой беседа на, на тему музыкальная граф граматика и теория. Я это, этот доклад давал уже много раз на конференции музыка, музыкального комитета синодального. Ну и, и всегда это давал по-английски, поэтому иногда я просто автоматически перейду на английский язык, потому что я уже это более-менее так, так выучил. В основном на музыкальных конференциях синодальных, которые уже больше 30 лет существуют, со всей Америки и из Европы и, 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 приезжали, собирались на конференцию молодые и, и не такие молодые певчие. И там были целый ряд э, лекций на, на, на тему разные музыкальные, о композиторах, о разных стилях пения. И потом все участники на конференции собирались на спевке, выучивали то, что нужно, и у нас обыкновенно там была архирейская литургия и, и, и все на это. И было заметно вначале, что приезжали люди, которые очень много знали по музыке, и приезжали те, которые первый раз при, э, вообще слышали много из терминологии. И вот Александр Литковский, сын Бориса Михайловича Литковского, который в свое время был дирижером синодального хора в Нью-Йорке, он сделал такую основную программу, и назвали это «Урок по салфейхе». Как вы увидите, те, кто знают, что салфейхе, это не совсем салфейхе выходит, это основная грамматика. После того, как Александр скончался, лет 20 тому назад, меня попросили эти лекции читать на этих конференциях. И несколько из наших хористов, которые не были на конференции, сказали, а мог бы ты это у нас прочитать, чтобы мы тоже знали это. Ну, я согласился. И вот сегодня как раз первый, первый в общем, пробочный такой разговор. Commentary. For choir members, some of this may be reviewed. Most of it might be reviewed. For those who have never studied music, This will be entirely new, it will be entirely overwhelming. And you may ask yourself the question, why am I listening to this? And the answer is to treat this as, a, uh, uh, as an abstract learning opportunity. For those of you, for example, who don't know how to speak in Finnish, I, I'm one. Okay? Uh, if I was to attend a lecture on how to speak the Finnish language, I would do that purely out of academic interest. At the end of the lesson, I probably wouldn't be able to speak Finnish. But there may be one or two words later on that I might be able to understand. Like, for example, goal, when the Finnish hockey team scores a goal. Okay? <laughs> From that standpoint, this lecture is going to be really hard for some people. And the reason is, when you typically go to a conference, you go and attend a lecture, somebody describes the process, explains it, and then comes up with a conclusion, like some new medical procedure, or some sort of a mathematical approach to prove that a bridge won't hold, or will or won't fall down. There's a beginning and an end. In this case, there really isn't a beginning. And there isn't an end. This is a lot of terminology, a lot of theory that for some may be useful, for others, like I say, treat it just as abstractly, you learn something new. The reason why I chose this as the first uh, discussion is because we have additional courses that are in the process of being planned now that will be given over the course of the next couple of months on church music notation, on Osmi Glacia. Uh, the, the glossy system that we use every every week and every service. Also, particularly for our new choir members, the structure of the common service and how our books are organized. Uh, that's not really just for choir members. I think it'll be very helpful to those who attend services, may not know a lot about the structure. You may get a little bit more of a perspective on why the services are structured the way that they are. And then finally, choral performance. This should be a really fun session. Uh, it, I'm, you know, I'm working with it now. So, it's a hard course. 
But for some, you may say, hey, I know that, and you feel good about it. So, uh, let's start. Music, fundamentally, is a collection of sounds and silences. We all know about music being sound, but there are cases where the silences that occur in music are just as exciting, and certainly they're just as important. The modern way to define the sounds and silences that comprise music is to notate it. This is nothing new, you've all seen this. The modern staff system consists of five lines, you've seen this. It, comprise, it, it, it includes rests, which indicate periods of silence, and notes, which indicate uh, periods of, of sound. The names of notes comprising an octave are in the European system, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. In the English system, they start and go from C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C. An octave is an interval where the vibration frequency between one note and the other note is exactly two or one half. This is, this is what an octave sounds like. So this has uh, 320 vibrations per minute. This has 640. It's exactly double. That's what defines an octave. Notes within a scale, you all, you, you all have heard, that's a scale. They differ in vibration frequency, and they increase from the lower octave to the upper octave, or decrease from the upper to the lower. There are different types of scales. They differ by the amounts that the notes next to one another change, and we'll talk quite a bit about that. Here you see two steps, and the, the notes on the steps indicate the name of the note, as if you remember I said C, uh, C, D, uh, F, G, and so forth, and the position on the staff. Okay? Uh, there are very uh, various ways of memorizing this. One of them is that for the top line, if you memorize the phrase, every good boy does fine, there's the first line, E, G, D, D, F. Every good boy does fine. The notes in the spaces F, A, C, E. The spaces simply spell out the, the, the word face. So if somebody asks you, what is the note that belongs on this bottom line? It's every, from every good point, that's fine. What about the second line? Every good cheat, that's it. What about the third line? Every good boy, D. That's one way of memorizing what the lines and spaces on a staff mean. There are different types of staves, and I'll talk about that in a minute. This happens to be a G clef staff. This is an F bass staff. And it has different identifications for the lines. For, for the lines, if you remember great big dogs fight animals, <laughs> then you'll remember G, uh, G, B, B, F, A. Uh, for those of you that don't really want to remember this, don't. Okay? <laughs> and, and for those that do want to remember this, I would, I would suggest not to use this every good boy thing. Just, just learn it over time, it'll be easier. So the names of the lines and spaces on a staff correspond to the name of the note that is in that line of staff. That's, that's the point of this slide. We talked about clefs. Up on the top line, you see three different clefs. The one on the very left, that's called the G clef. And the reason it's called the G clef is because this little curly cue here defines the line that's called G. That's where the no G is. This is called an F clef because it defines the line on which the note F is. 
These are very common. A much less common is a C clef. It's used in some older notation and it's used in orchestral scores. And what it does is it defines where the note C is, or Do. Okay. So once a particular note is defined, all of the other notes that are written are defined relative to it. So for example, if F is one note lower than G, F would be here. If A is one note higher than G, it would be here. It specifies where you start counting the notes from. That's all the clef does. Staffs that are musical lines, they enable you to define the pitch and duration of a note or a rest. That's what their function is. So in this case, you can tell that this note and this note and this note and this note take up equal amounts of time. And because this note is higher than this note, if you were to sing it, you would start with this one and sing the next one higher. How much higher, we'll talk about in a minute. In addition to defining what the location of the pitch is on a staff and what notes there are, also staffs tell you how to execute whatever the music is. There are various names. Uh, uh, grab is one. Grab means very slow. There are ways to indicate whether it's loud, soft, increasingly loud, increasingly soft, and the manner in which you would execute them. So the staff provides a musician uh, and a singer with a great deal of information on what the composer has written for the individual to execute. So now scales. Scales provide a framework for music. They consist of regular patterns of, of pitch, and they differ by whole steps and half steps, and we'll talk about all of that. Scales are named by the pitch with which they begin and end. In this example, this is a C major scale. The reason is because it starts with C or Do, and it goes all the way up until it reaches C again. So this is a C scale. It's written here in G clef, where this note is G, because that's what this defines. And it's also the same scale is written in F clef. And you notice that F, this note here, is defined by the F clef. So this is merely a way to illustrate for a composer who has a, uh, who has a music in his, in, in his or her head to write it down in a way that somebody far, far away, either in time or distance, can execute the same thing that was in his or her head in, in performance. There are sharps that look like the hashtag sign, and there are flats that don't look like anything. The sharps, if they're added to a note, will raise the pitch a half a tune. That's what the sharp does. A flat, if it's written next to a note, will lower the pitch of a note. This is important because as you are performing music, if you have one note that, that you're singing, and then the next note has a sharp or a flat on it, you have to ex execute a different jump to that note than if it didn't have a sharp or a flat. So scales are constructed from something called a tetrachord. And every scale is, every major scale is constructed from two tetrachords. In the simple case of C major, you have the first tetrachord, which sounds like this. That's the lower tetrachord. The next one, that's how a scale is conducted, uh, is comprised. And what you see is that between these two, there's a whole step, uh, excuse me, between these two, there's a full step. Between this and this, there's a full step. And between this and this is a half step. That's how a tetrachord is composed. Be same thing happens here. 
between this note and this note is a full step, this note and this note is a half step, this note and this note is a half step. I think I got that wrong. Full step, full step, half step. And between tetrachords is a whole step. Why is it that way? That's, that's what the diatonic scale was constructed. So for us, just simply knowing this will allow us to understand why there are sharps and flats in key signatures. So again, lower tetrachord, upper tetrachord. Between the lower and the upper is a whole tone. Take that simply as being a fact. Okay? Observe that in the C major scale, there are no sharps and no flats to artificially raise any of the notes. They just come out like a scale without having to use any of the black keys. Okay? Now, remember this scale, this tetrachord here, because the next scale up from this C major scale is a G major scale. Starts on G, has the same pattern. Whole step, whole step, half step. Whole step between, whole step, whole step to the C sharp, and then half step. Everybody get that? Whole, whole, half. Whole, whole between here and here which requires an F-sharp and a G. <clears throat> that's the reason why G major has one sharp in it, and that sharp is F. Okay. Is there a question? Yeah, so when I I visually see what you're explaining, but why is from B to C it's a half step? If, from what is it? From B what to mechanically C. makes B, B, C a half step? Simply the change in pitch so as opposed to. This is a half step. This is a full step. It's simply the way the piano is constructed because that's the way the diatonic scale was developed by people okay. a long, long time ago. Now that makes sense because okay. it is basically. Okay. So what we notice here is. The first scale that we did was C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. This was a tetrachord, lower tetrachord, this was the upper tetrachord, and between them, it was a whole step. Now, if we take the upper tetrachord of C and construct a G major scale, in order for it to come out right, you need to have an F sharp. In. And the way that, that that sounds, if I can play it properly, If there was no F sharp, it would be, which is not the sort of scale that we're used to. Okay. So, what we just did is we talked about the G major scale, and in order for it to, to follow the rules of a major scale, we had to sharp the F. If we look at the D major scale, okay, it starts D, E, F sharp, G, the same way that here we started D, E, F sharp, G. So it's the upper, it's the next one in the progression. And here we have a whole tone, a whole tone because the F sharp is sharp, and a half a tone here from F sharp to G, which comprises this lower tetrachord. The upper tetrachord has a whole tone, needs a C sharp to make a whole tone here, and then a half tone. So there's your upper tetrachord, and between them is a whole tone. I spent quite a bit of time on this only so that it makes you know fundamental sense, because otherwise, uh, when we start looking at key signatures, it, you, you'll be asking a question, why is all that stuff there? This is the reason it's there. So as an exercise, a major scale, okay. what sharps or flats do we need? Well, from A to B is a whole tone, so we're good here. From 
B to C is only a half a tone, right? So we need a sharp on the C. C, C sharp to D is a half a tone, so we have one, one, and one half if we put a sharp on the C. Between these, we have a whole tone, so we're good. From the E to an F is only a half a tone, so we need a sharp on the F. And to get a whole tone from an F sharp to a G, we need to sharp the G. So if you see three sharps in the key signature, they're going to be F, C, and G. And when you see those three sharps, that means you're in the key of A major. If that matters to you, consider yourself lucky. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So we're talking here about scales that are defined by sharps. The same thing happens with scales that, uh, that have flats in them. F major has a whole tone, whole tone, half tone between A and B. There's the lower triad, then C, D, uh, whole tone, whole tone, half tone without any additional flats. So when you see a key signature with a B flat in it, that's F major, if you're in a major key. The next triad up starts with a B flat. B flat to C is one tone, C to D is one tone. Here you need a half a tone to make that triad, so you need an E flat. From the lower triad, the tetrachord, to the upper tetrachord, you need a whole tone, and that's okay the way it is. F to G is a whole tone, G to A is a whole tone, but now you have to have a half tone. So again, that same B sharp, B flat, applies here. That's about as much music theory as I'm going to present. Okay, that's the reason. Slava Bova, somebody said, right? <laughs> there is such a thing as called the circle of fifths. And what it says is that from the key of C, which has no sharps and flats, if you go in a clockwise direction, the first key from it is G, it has one sharp. The second is D, it has two sharps. Then A with three sharps, that's the exercise that we did. Then the key of E major with four sharps, and then finally the key of B. And between each one of these notes is an interval of a fifth, and we'll talk about intervals in a minute. And then going counterclockwise is the same thing. From C to F is a, is a, uh, is a, is a fourth, one flat, two flat, three flats, four flats, five flats. At some point, it may matter to you, and you'll remember that there is such a thing as a, as a circle of fifths. Okay, so key signatures. We talked about clefs, G clef, F clef. Now we're adding to it these sharps and flats. And so what they do is, in a piece of music, when you have in the key signature a sharp or two or three or flats two or three, what they say is for the entire piece, any note that is an F up top or an F here or an F any place, has to be executed as an F sharp, a half tone higher than an F. That's the rule. Or in the case on the far right, this piece is, uh, this is B flat major key signature, so anywhere in the piece, if there's a B or an E, it must be executed with that note flattened by a half a tone. The only way that that, that that rule changes is if somewhere later on in the music, the composer redefines a new key signature, where a different set of notes is sharp or flat. Or there's a thing called an accidental mark that temporarily changes the applicability of the key signature. So you could be running along singing 15 measures of a song that has an F-sharp key signature, 
all of a sudden you run into a mark like this on the F, now you don't have to sharpen anymore. You just sing natural F. But then later, <coughs> later if you come across that note, again the sharp will flat applies. That's just basic music grammar. There's, there's just, you know, there's no real reason for it. Okay, so here are some common and uncommon key signatures. We talked about C, C major, no sharps, no flats. G major, one sharp, and it's F. G major, two sharps, A, this is the one we did as the exercise, then E with four and B with five. Okay. If this kind of thing is interesting to you, okay, and you come across and you see a key signature and you forget this lecture and you say, my goodness, you know, four sharps, what key is that? The way, to, uh, the way to name the key, should you be so inclined, is you go to the key signature, move to the note above the leftmost sharp. So, if I'm interested in figuring out what key signature is that, I go to the, this should be rightmost, I'll correct that. You go to the rightmost sharp, go one note up, and that defines an E, okay? Same thing, same mistake, this is rightmost. If you're interested in figuring out what is the, uh, the key signature, that the, 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 what is the key signature that this defines? In the case of flats, you go to the rightmost flat and go down a fourth, and that will define no. If this means nothing to you, don't worry about it. Okay, intervals. Very, very important topic. Um, again, I use the C major scale because it's the simplest. On the piano, it's all the white keys. Going from Do or A, uh, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, Mi, Do. What this chart shows you is the distance between Do to Re, Do to Mi, Do to Fa, and so forth. And there are names for this, so that when you're talking about music, when you're trying to learn music, you can converse on this. This is simple vocabulary. So, the, the interval from Do to Re is called a supertonic in English. It's called Secunda in, in, in Russian. And it, the interval from Do is a major second. Here's what it sounds like. That's what a secunda is. And uh, how can you remember this? Well, the beginning of Spasibo Spadi. A lot of things in, in music, if you can remember elements of it, you can apply those elements over and over again, and that's one way that you can learn how to execute music. <coughs> the second one, very, very important uh, interval, is the terzi. It's called a major third. And it sounds like this. And there are several ways to remember it. You can, uh, if you're into the Pascal Pascal Nancy so that's what a major second sounds like. Okay. Major four, subdominant, called quarta. Major four. The way to remember it is, here comes the bride. That, that interval is a major four. Okay. Next one up, perfect fifth, is called quinta. It's also called the dominant. And it sounds like this. So if you're familiar with Chisnakov's, that, that interval. That's what it, what that is a perfect fifth. Um, these intervals, knowing them and learning them to a musician, especially a, a, a vocalist, are, is extremely important. It is the way that you wind up sight reading music. The next one up is the submedian, sixta, major sixth. Sounds like this. 
And the way that I remember it, that's what that is. Uh, Septima Major 7th, if you're familiar with, with uh, uh, West Side Story, that's what that interval is like. That. So, those are, those are intervals. Majority of times, because of the way that a lot, not all, but a lot of Russian Orthodox church music is written, if you're in the part, like the soprano, that tends to sing melody, you generally are going to operate in this area. You're going to have a lot of major seconds, you're going to have a lot of major thirds, some perfect fourths, some perfect fifths. But generally, the way the church melodies are constructed, there aren't any real huge jumps. Okay. Uh, there's a, uh, in, in Handel's Messiah, there's a, there's a, a, a chorus the, to the text, let us break their bonds. And the soprano sings, let us break their bonds at big, big intervals. We don't have a lot of that in church music. As a matter of fact, most of our church music melodies flow fairly evenly, so that the sizes of the jumps of the melodies tend to be sort of in this area. <clears throat> if you're a bass, it's a real good idea to know perfect fourths and perfect fifths and octaves, because that's, that's a lot of what we sing when we accompany the melodies that are sung by the tenors of the sopranos of the alphas. But for, for, a, for a church choir musician, having a good idea of all of these intervals is very important. We've been talking about C major uh, scales. I just want to make sure if, if, if you sit down at a piano, uh, diminished intervals are intervals that are smaller than what their name suggests. Okay? And the smallest diminished interval that we have in our music system is what you find between white and black keys and between white keys where there is no black key. And it sounds like this. <laughs> That's a chromatic scale where each interval changes by the least amount that it can possibly change. Okay? That's the whole point of this. So let's talk about intervals again. Uh, I'll just play you what's there from Do to Re, Do to Mi, Terza. Do fa quarta, do sol quinta, sexta, settima. So those are the intervals in the C major scale. Diminished intervals <clears throat> are intervals that sound just like the ones that I play, except they don't go quite as far away from one another. Augmented intervals are intervals that are increased by a half a tone. Okay. Very important, intervals are the same regardless of the note with which they begin. So let's take the one that, uh, that's the easiest for me to remember. Here comes the bride, the fourth. That interval is exactly the same as Here comes the bride, here comes the bride. Exact same change in pitch, except the note that it started on is different. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So in other words, the distance between the note doesn't matter where the note starts from. The distance is still the same. So what I've illustrated here is Every one of those jumps is exactly the same, it just starts at a different note. Okay? The other thing that's good about intervals is it doesn't matter whether it's going up or down. So, it's the same as 
So a fourth is a fourth, irrespective of where it starts and whether you're going up or down. The major third, very, very important interval, because it helps define whether you're in a major or a minor key. And it has, uh, be between the low note and the high note, or the high note and the low note, it has a total of four half tones. And it sounds like every, irrespective of which note you start on, C to E is terzi. D to F sharp, terzi. F to A, terzi. Every one of these lines illustrates the same change, and it happens to be terzi, which is a major third. Male terzi, which sounds like this, as opposed to, this is a major one, previous slide. This is a male, this slide. You can hear the difference, right? It has the same properties. C to E flat, D to F, G to B flat. That interval is the same irrespective of where it starts. So you might be thinking, if you're thinking ahead of a, a, a little bit, and you say, okay, so I want to learn a piece of music. I don't know what key it's in. I don't particularly care. But I know that right now I'm on this note, and I need to get to this one. I wonder what the interval is, because if I can identify the interval, then I can remember, you know, it's either here comes the bride or, uh, or some other thing, and you can get from one note to the next, which is the whole idea of how to read music for a singer. So, <clears throat> by learning all of the intervals from do re to do a si, from to by learning every one of those intervals with uh, diminished and augmented varieties, if you have that in your head, then you should be able to sight read any piece that is written in C major. And the way that you do that <coughs> is by using the so-called movable door system. So, let's take, for example, Do, Mi, Do, Mi, that's a major third, terzi. It happens to be the same distance as Fa, La, Fa, La. In this case, if you learn everything relative to, to C major, you can apply those intervals, starting having this note play the role of this note. Does that make sense? Okay. So the whole idea of it is, is when you're looking at a piece of music, and you see, for example, these two notes next to one another, after some time in practice, you'll recognize, oh, that's a perfect fourth. That's a pom pom, here comes the bride. So whichever note you are on, you take that note and you assign it the role of do. So this now mentally for me is do. This is a fourth away. So from here to here is pom pom. And so if you can do that once, you can do that many times from note to note, where each note that you're on you assign it the role of Do. The next note away <clears throat> defines the interval which you need to recognize, and at that point you can sing that interval. So if you can do that continuously, then whatever music you're singing, you can go from note to note and hit the right notes. Which of course makes choir directors very, very happy. <laughs> okay, solfagio, which was what this course was originally called. Solfeggio is a, is a method of, of learning music where uh, rather than try to sing text like a prayer or a, or a, or a song or, or a ballad or whatever, you sing the music actually 
assigning, uh, using the, the names of the notes as the text. Okay, so uh, it, it was it was developed as, as a learning technique that came out of uh, a, a practice in the 10th century where there was a monk who had a choir uh, uh, that, that, that they were leading, that he was leading in church for prayers. And they didn't have, uh, not everybody knew the melodies. So this, this monk developed a technique where he would point to parts of his hand. And so if, if he did this, the monks would, uh, would sing the next word a little bit higher. If he did this, they would sing it a lot higher. If he did this, it would be higher still. So he wound up having musical notation simply by in intervals on his hand. And that's the way that, they would, uh, that he would remind his singers of what the melody was. And so that became known as the Gideon hand, I think I say it somewhere here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the Gideon hand. And it was widely used in Europe. At that time, you know, printing was, was not possible. And so they saw this one do it and they said, hey, that, that's a pretty neat way to do it. So if, if we were to use that today, it would be like this. Спасибо, Господи, люди Твоя, и благослови достояние Твое. Okay? Very good. So, Fischer, no, that, that technique was, was adopted by the French, and, and they actually improved on it, and they created this business of solfege, where we can, we, when you saw printed notes, okay, uh, you would assign that name to it. So, uh, in the case of Spisibos, but you'd be Do, Do, Re, Mi, Do, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, 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 Mi, 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 Re, Re, Do. That is Spisibos, but you did to ya in solfege. Uh, if, if you all want to go home and do that, then you can claim on your resume that you know so big. <laughs> okay, sight singing. Sight singing, geht's ist um, is a relatively complex process. So, uh, what I try to do here is to break it down into its parts. Okay? Sight reading is visually recognizing what the interval from the note that you're on to the next note is. This business of saying, oh, I know, this is a perfect four, or no, this is a quinta, or this is a eight. Recognizing that by looking at the notes and seeing how far away that is. That's the first part. Secondly, oh, okay, and this, so in this example, la do, that's a minor third, male terze. If you can remember that, then you know that it's going to change by this much. Rhythmic point at which the next note needs to be sung. So just going from the note that you're on to the next one can't be done any old time, otherwise you're not executing the music. So you need to understand whether it's a quick change or a change that has to happen after a while so that you're singing the music rhythmically. There's also the issue of text. The note that you're on is that syllable going to continue to the next note, or is there a new syllable on the next note? So you have to keep in mind that aspect too. And, if, and most people, when they sight read, uh, they more or less do this. Okay, Good sight readers will do this. The most thing that's forgotten is the performance marking. So if you're going to sing the right interval at the right time, uh, and to the right text, but it's supposed to be soft and you sing it loud, now you foul up the music. Okay? So there's, there's other aspects to it. You know, should it be soft, should it be loud, should it be accented, or should it be very smooth? Okay? Uh, that's the fourth element of sight reading that uh, in, in many cases people get. So that's the first part. Before you even make a sound, these are the things that have to go on up here. Hmm. Then, that interval that we started with, you have to hear that in your mind before you can actually sing. So if I'm on an A, and I have to sing C, 
I need to think. Oh, oh. That's what I need to hear up here, so that I can sing. Oh, oh. Understand? That's what the hearing part. Up here, you need to hear that. And then finally, after doing all of this brain work, then you actually sing, you actually make the sound, which is the next note on the right text, at the right point in time, and with the correct manner. That's what sight singing consists of. So, um, over the course of time, uh, I had put together for the for the conference people, I had put together a series of intervals that I suggested they go home and learn. And this first one uh, I learned when I was in the 12th grade in high school. And what the, 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 the great thing about this little solfege piece is that if you have an A natural tuning fork, then they're gone, that gives you this note. That note is this one. So if you happen to carry one of these around with you, you always have to. And, ah, <laughs> join the choir. <laughs> so in this little set of intervals, you pick up every note in the C major scale. So it goes like this. La, sol, la, fa, la, mi, la, re, la, do, la, ti, la, do, la. Every note in the scale is one that you can get by having an A in your brain. Okay? So what I suggested in, uh, to, to the people at the conference, many of whom were young choir directors, is that if you can get that interval, that set of intervals into your head, and you have a pigoton, you should be in good shape to be able to find any note that you want in order to get your chorus to start. Okay? In addition, I supplied them with the following intervals. This one. Again. Now from the same, which is the same as this. La, sol, do, sol, mi, do. Very, very useful interval for giving pitches to a choir. Oftentimes we sing things in C major. So with a tuning fork. La, sol, do, sol, mi, do. And your choir starts singing in C major. F major, so called do, la, fa. Most of you have probably heard do, la, fa many, many times. The interval that I suggested that they learn is. La sol fa, la do, la fa. It's a very easy way that you can memorize to get from this thing to do la fa. Other intervals. Most, uh, much of our music that we sing in church is written in G major. If you, if you, after this. You know, lecture. If you look at our church books, a lot of times you'll find this thing is written with one sharp in the key signature. So, a way for choir directors to get to a G major chord are. And that re si sol is what defines the pitches that the choir members start to sing. Okay? And an easy way to get to it is. Remembering that thing in the, in the previous slide. La, sol, ti, re, ti, sol. Another one that's related to G major, uh, to, to G major, is D major. La, sol, ti, re. Which is the same piece as you've learned here, except now you go. Re, la, fa, re. Just a very easy way to get from an A. 440 to different uh, the different pitches that occur in the music that we sing. There's also a thing called G major seven, which is which is the way that several glossy begin. Первый глас, второй глас, and oh by the way, happy birthday. Happy birthday. It's a nice way to start that. 
Okay. So the way that you get to the G major seven, again, is very similar to the way, to the way that we used before. <coughs> La sortie de la forêt. And there is your seventh chord. Okay. E major. La sortie de soli. Where the last three notes are. Which defines an E minor chord. These are typically very useful intervals for choir directors to know. And uh, there shouldn't be any real secrets between choir members and church singers. They should know what's being given to them. Okay? It can't just be, oh, and sing that note. They should understand where in the chord they are. So that's why I present this kind of stuff to choirs, uh, choir singers as well as choir directors. Um, okay. Uh, how long into this session are we? Has anybody been keeping track of time? No. <laughs> there's, there's a fair amount of stuff here on intervals that I'm going to need to go faster on. Uh, <clears throat> a minor. Uh, all, all of these, if anybody would like a, a copy of this handout, write me an email, I'll send it to you in case this is kind of stuff that you'd like to do. Uh, there are also more complicated uh, sequences that I suggested to choir directors and also wanted to make sure that the choir understood. Okay? And they are, I'm sure to, to many of you this will be familiar. So the pitches that I give to the choir are actually So a choir, a choir member may be there saying, okay, look, you just sang six pitches at me. What do you want me to do? Which of those six pertain to me? Okay. I always go with the first note I hear. Good point. So we're going to solve that problem right here and now. Uh -huh. <laughs> no more excuses. Look, so this is called G major from D major. And I'll do it again. Which is G major. Remember that. As opposed to. Okay. The only difference to them, but a big important difference, is that the T in this case doesn't have a flat on it. So, or you get the difference between the two? Okay, great. Hang on to that difference. Because this is why it's important. Think to yourself, for example, the Sunday Trapadia, for those of you who actually go to Sianus, yeah? okay? Uh, and the, the Trapadia during Utrina. Remember that? Okay? In it, this, uh, this actually, that, that prayer is written in G major. Okay? G major. But, so this Nechayne starts with this chord, okay? So if I was to give to the choir, half of them could sing, right? The other half could say, which would be a train wreck. Okay? So, the way that I avoid the train wreck is by telling them, here is where we're going, here's where we're starting from to get here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, for example, for the Sudhisnachana is where we're going, beginning with so whoever is singing from the A, 
as opposed to by telling the choir where we're going, this now becomes an unambiguous beginning because you know that you're going from this to this. Same thing occurs in the, in the minor case. Uh, when we sing Alleluia. Remember that at the beginning of Panichida? This says where we're going. As opposed to, if I didn't do this, and it was just, it could be sung as, which would be absolutely a mess. Okay? So that's why I, I teach these intervals to choir directors, and I want to expose our singers to why these make sense. Okay, so if you're only, if, if you're of the type that says, you know what, sing whatever you want at me, okay, I don't care. When it comes time to, for my note, just point to me. That's the wrong attitude. Because it's very important to understand where the whole thing is going to go, and then understand which note you start from. Otherwise, you can get into a completely different harmony. Okay, that's what... That, that's what's necessary to explain to singers and also to young conductors so that they can avoid those kinds of problems. Okay, minor scales. There are three types. What makes a minor scale is the fact that the tertia that we talked about before is diminished. Rather than one, one, one half for the tetrachord, it's one, one half, one. So here's how this sounds. <coughs> That's a, that's a natural minor scale. You're not fooling around with any of the notes. Here it is again. There's a thing called a harmonic scale, where you sharp the next to last note. And also there's a melodic minor scale, Three types. Uh, most uh, most of music that we sing today in minor keys is in the in the minor it is in the harmonic sense. For example, Tsirinibiasne. The important thing is it's this has this has the form of a of a of a harmonic scale. The original way that this was sung is with a natural minor. As opposed to. You feel the difference? Okay. Same thing. As opposed to. This is the more authentic way that these are, are sung. This is how we've come to harmonize it, primarily because uh, Russia was not so far away from Europe, and a lot of European influence came in to Russia. Um, I'll try to speed up. A minor, which we just talked about, here it is, has no sharps and flats. Same as C major. So they're related somehow. And in fact, musicians have said that they are the relative minor. A minor is the relative minor of C major. So you could probably extrapolate and think that, well, if that's the case, if A minor is the relative uh, minor of C, then there must be a relative minor of the other notes related to how many sharps and flats are in the, in the signature. And in fact, that's true. I'm not going to go through each one of these other than to illustrate that when you have a key signature, 
from everything that we've talked about today, we've talked about major scales. Okay, it's important to, uh, to understand that along with that major scale, there's also a relative minor, and its relationship is the same as between C, ma C major and A minor. Oops. Okay, chords. The chord that's up there is. Chords are, uh, are sounds that are played simultaneously, okay? And there are different varieties of them. The first two is C major, and this, this, the one right next to it is simply a, 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 more, uh, a more populated chord. So that's this one and this one. C minor is a minor chord because it has male terzi. So this, as opposed to, that's the difference between them. And the note that makes the difference is the terzia note. This is why in all of our rehearsals, one of the things that I stress is when we're singing something, I ask the choir, who has terzia? And the right people need to raise their hand because they're responsible for making this either a major or minor key. Okay? Very, very important. Other things about chords. There are sustained chords, like for example here. For a long time, this, this, and this note are sung at the same time. And there are passing or intermittent chords, where these three notes are sung for a short amount of time, then this one stays and this one changes. So it's passing, but it's still the same relationship. You have multiple, uh, multiple, signs, uh, multiple sounds being executed at the same time. The one on the far uh, right there, C major seven, is just a different variety of a C major for the C chord. Okay, examples of chords. <clears throat> These are actually excerpts from some of our books. Okay, um, I wish I had, I, I'm, I'm running, I think, for the longest time. Uh, these, this is a B major chord, okay, a B flat major chord. The tenor is in the tenor. This is an A. A minor chord that says in the tenor. And this is a D major seventh chord, where the pensa is actually up in the uh, in the alpha. Okay. This is what I talked about before. This is actually written in G. It starts in D with a seventh. A minor, no sharps or flats. If you looked at this thing without seeing the notes, you'd say, oh, no sharps, no flats, C major. Well, maybe not. It can be the relative minor as well. <clears throat> Rhythm is a time relationship between sounds. Uh, pieces of music that's subdivided into measures. Key signatures define the amount of time in a particular measure. For this case, we have four beats total. The quarter note is the one that gets the beat. So if you were counting this, it would be one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. If you had these notes to sing, it would be one, two, three, four. If you had this note to sing, it would be one, two, three, four. And what I'm trying to show here is the relationship between a whole note, a half note, quarter note, eighth note, two eighth notes comprise a quarter, four sixteenth notes comprise two eighths, or two sixteenths comprise eight. So if you did well in, in elementary school math, the, the, this, this, this should work for you. The illustration that we showed, again, we talked about four beats, quarter note gets the beat. There are other commonly occurring time signatures, three, four, Three beats to a measure, quarter note gets the beat. So it's one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Something I can't dance to. 
2, 4 is 2 beats per measure, quarter note gets the beat. 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. 2, 2 time is 2 beats per measure, uh, the half note gets the beat. So it's 1, 2, 1, 2. Three, three, uh, three halves, 3 beats per measure, half note gets the beat. 4 8, as it implies, is 4 beats to a measure, the eighth note gets the beat. 6 8 looks and smells like 4 8, but isn't. 6 8 time is never beat, is never done 1 2 3 4 5 6, 1 2 3 4 5 6. It's a special application for writing music that goes like this 1 2 3 2 2 3, 1 2 3 2 2. So you get one, two, three, two, two, three, that's six. Eight note gets the beat, but it's 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 done differently. So if you get a piece of music and it has six eight in it, don't start thinking six beats per measure. It's two beats of of, uh, of three eights. And the same thing with nine eight. It's one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, three, three. Two. In Western music, it's typical that in four beats per measure, you have a pattern like this going on. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And notice that on one and three, I instinctively make an accent. Three beats per measure. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Instinctively, there's a beat on one and one. Two beats per measure. One, two, one. We've been all brought up that way just simply because of the music that we hear, whether it's classical rock or anything else. For, for, uh, for vocal music with text, composers should try to fit the text of the work that you're singing such that the accents fall on the right syllables. Okay? That doesn't always happen. Okay? Some of the typical cases that, 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 that will get us in trouble. If we follow, see, every one of these has a, has a strong one, two, whether it's one, two, three, four, or whatever. So when we sing okay, the, the, the syllable that should have an accent is If we go uh, by the Western system without thinking what we're doing, We'll sing blaze as opposed to blaze. So that doesn't mean you know that all music is bad that's written this way. It just means that we as musicians need to interpret it right. And rather than sing blaze moves, we should sing blaze moves and put the syllable on the right accent. Same thing. How many people have heard spicy goes? Well, it's not spicy. It's spicy. So these are things that if we're aware of when, when we're either conducting or executing the music, we can avoid these kinds of uh, things. Uh, and this is my favorite. It's not that. It's but there's really no notation for this. This is something that we need to be aware of, which is why we come to meetings like this. Okay, dots. Dots add value to a note. So this dot adds half of the value of this to it. Comprise. So here's the base note, here's half of the value, and here's the addition. That's the way dots work. Okay. Here's the base note. Take half of the value of this, add it together, that's how long this note is. And those are just multiple, uh, multiple uh, illustrations. There's a thing called a tie or a slur. What it does is it adds, uh, it, it, it uh, tells you to perform adjacent notes in a smooth, connected, uninterrupted fashion. So, for example, in this, you might recognize this is 
Okay, that's what that tie is trying to tell you. Connect those notes and slur them. The other thing that a tie does is notice that this is a G sharp, right? It's it would stay G sharp only for as long as that note is. But because it's tied across a bar line, if you were if you were going to sing this, you would need to sing this note as a G sharp as well because it's tied. So those are the two things that ties do. This is common accidentals. We talked about flats, we talked about sharps. This is a natural sign. It says that if something was sharp or flat before, ignore it for, the, for that note. So for example, if we were singing this G as a G sharp, and we came across this as being the next note, we couldn't sing it the same way, we'd have to go down a half, because that, that natural sign negates the sharp or flat as before. Okay? There's a way of writing the same note different ways. This is an A natural, this is a G double sharp. Same note. They look different, but it's the same note. This is a C natural, this is a D double sharp. So this is a D that you go, that's uh, double flat, excuse me, double flat. So we definitely need you for the choir. <laughs> so those two notes actually have the same pitch, although they look different. And there are times when, when it's convenient to write them that way. Tuplets. Tuplets are regular divisions of notes. Uh, we're used to seeing things like one and two and three and four. Uh, any, any, any division of two, four, eight, and so forth are ones that we typically come across. Tuplets divide an amount of time into other, in my opinion, nasty divisions. Things like threes and fives and sevens. And so the most common tuplet that we come across is triplets. And in this case, this, these three notes are supposed to occupy exactly the same amount of time as this one, or this one, or this one. So if we were going to sing this on top, this would be ta, 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 ta. That's what this is. Ta, 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 ta. That's, the, that's the way the couplet is, is executed. A common mistake is to cheat and do da, 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 which is easier because we're all thinking in divisions of two and four, but is wrong. The proper way is bum, 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 like that. So that's the thing to be careful. The, the, the message of the slide is when you see the, the triplet, make sure you don't convert it to something that's easier for you to sing, sing the triplet. Grand staff, that's what it looks like. Um, we, we use the grand staff all the time for most of our music. It's simple. We have the soprano and alto. The soprano is stems up, alto down. Tenors and basses share the lower line. Tenors up, basses down. So from this, you can sing you know, things like, let's see, you know, the music. Notice that this is in B flat major and the tenors have the text. Okay? For more complicated music, you might have a situation where between the bass and the tenor, there's a lot more complicated stuff going on. So in that case, you have the soprano and the alto still sharing the top line. You have the tenors using a G clef, but executed at an octave lower all by themselves on that line, and then you have basses. And a good reason for do that, doing that is because when you get part splits in the basses, you want, to, you want to make sure that the tenors know what they're supposed to sing and what the basses know what they're supposed to sing. So there's just more room to illustrate the notes. And when you get into real cool stuff, this is a case, by the way, you'll be hearing this uh, in October. 
This is where each one of the parts has their own line. So this is first and second sopranos. First sopranos up step, seconds down. Altos, uh, they don't have a split here, but if they had notes going down, that would be first and second altos. Tenors, clearly, uh, first tenors up, second tenors down. And in the bass part, depending on how lucky you are, you can have first bass, baritone, bass, and bass octave. Okay. In this case, we have first bass, baritone, bass, and we could add octave. Um, I'm going to skip this for today because this gets, uh, this is really primarily for choir singers and it's a long discussion, we just don't have time. Uh, performance markings, we talked about those. Uh, a lot of them are, are given in, in Italian. Crescendo, gradually increasing volume. Dividuendo, gradually decreasing in volume. Fermata is a temporary departure from, from the prevailing rhythm. So uh, it would be, uh, let's see, uh, if, if, you put, if you put a fermata on Vosva, it would be Vosvodi Vosva. Okay, Vosva is in a different tempo than, than the rest of it. Very important breath marks for, 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 for choir singing. Every now and then we absolutely need to breathe all together, or in other cases we must not breathe together. That's what a breath mark looks like, that's what a non breath mark looks like. In some cases, we need to make an accent on a note, for example, where the syllable is. In other cases, we shouldn't make an accent on a note. Like, for example, the last, uh, the last beat of a, of a piece of music. Uh, a good example is, uh, let's see. Gospodi pomiluj is wrong. It should be Gospodi So if I have to, to remind people not to put an accent on the last beat, I could use this little mark so that we would get Gospodi as opposed to Gospodi pomiluj, which is wrong. That's why those markings are important. Andre, we're missing our favorite one, which is glasses. Which one? <laughs> the glasses. Oh yeah. Well, that yeah. I mean, that that's that's uh, uh, that's for the next lesson. That that's actually in the performance thing. But you're absolutely right. So uh, dynamics: how loud, how soft. Uh, the the Italian school says pianissimo, very soft. Piano, soft. Mezzo piano, not so soft. Mezzo forte, not so loud. Forte. Loud, fortissimo, louder than you should ever sing. In some of the um, in some of the editions that you'll find from uh, Jorgensen from Russia, they didn't use the, the the Italian word. They put a T for ticha and a gr for gronka. So if you see that in a piece of music, it's not a misprint. It actually is a dynamic marking. Dynamic markings are relative. So sometimes I'll get a question: How loud should this be? Well, I don't know. It depends how you know how loud things were before or how soft things were before. So if we were singing, for example, something at a piano level, and the marking then is mezzo forte, then it should be louder than it was. Okay, these are relative markings. Other types of markings is this is this has to do with the speed of the work. Okay, this, if you believe the source that I have, this is an absolute scale. So if you're doing uh, a piece of music where the marking is adagio, to be academically correct, it should be one, two, three, four. That is adagio because that's 58 beats per minute. Okay? If you're doing allegro, it should be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, because I would beat the stick 132 times in a minute. In reality, we also tend to treat these in a relative fashion. And for the choir members that, that don't know, that don't carry around a metronome with them, there's a very simple solution. You look up at the director and, and your life is good. <laughs> legato is a method of expression. Legato is very, very smooth singing. Staccato is the exact opposite. 
So uh, staccato is actually a shortening of each note. So instead of singing, we don't do that, but that's what a staccato is. <laughs> Robato is a way of departing from the prevailing tempo. So let's, you know, you're, you're singing along, you want to make something of an accent somewhere, that's called a robato. Portamento. This is one of my least favorite. This is where people sing, that business. That is that is something that, that the only people that can get away with portamento are world class Italian tenors singing in an opera. That's where that's appropriate. This is never, never, never appropriate in choral singing. Because what happens is if you're supposed to execute, if you're supposed to do this, nice clean from one to the other, right? If somebody, and I don't say our sopranos do this, but if some, and, and they really don't, they really don't, but just for illustration purposes, if the soprano did, then if you slow it down into slow motion, you get this. It's an unwanted dissonance. It's dirty. <laughs> in, in, in the, so, tenors, sopranos, basses, everybody. Very, very important to go between pitches at one time. But the whole thing, of, ah, very, very bad. Uh, okay, accelerando, get faster, retard, get slower, as I'm being told to do. A tempo is after you have changed, after you've done something to the rhythm. A tempo means go back and do the same rhythm that you had before. Menomoso reduces speed. Subito, very important. Subito is immediately. So if you're going soft, 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 and you get a subito forte, immediately get louder. If you're loud, 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 you get a subito forte. It's an immediate hush. That's a very, very important mark. Okay, um, I just want to expose two more things and we're done. There is a style of singing uniquely Russian Orthodox that we don't do enough of, in my opinion, but we will start doing shortly. And that's called Chitok. Uh, those of you who sing, or those of you who listen to how we sing, uh, will more or less see how much different this is from the way that we normally do this. So have a little bit of patience and listen to this. I don't know how to stop this. So it's <laughs> okay, so that style is called Chitok. Okay, and what it basically says is there's two lengths of notes. There's a short and a long, and nothing in between. So you notice that he that they do Blagosloditu Shemoya Gospoda Blagoslavinisi Gospodi. We typically sing. We should we elongate the long notes and we shorten up the short notes. And that's okay. But that takes a chorus singing together, knowing one another, so that it all happens at the same time. And that's great to do on stuff that we know. Gospodi uh, was uh, uh, what's the one in Utrinya? 
or Gospod Strapari that we do all the time. That's easy to do, and that adds a bit of uh, a bit of expression. But a couple of years ago, when we had Blagodeshin on the first week of Pascha, and we had to sing everything, for us to rehearse everything that we had to sing, such that we could do it with that level of expression, would have taken 437 rehearsals. Okay. So what we did, whether you recall it or not, is I beat it exactly chitok for everything that we didn't commonly sing. And what that enabled us to do is rather than fool around with some sort of musicality, it was tup, 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 tup. all the words were in the right place. Nobody had to worry about anything other than singing the proper text. And so that's what Chitok is all about, because the guys that are singing this, Sretsinsky Monastirsky Chor, they go to church a lot more often than us. And in their services, they sing everything, whereas we read a lot. So for them to be able to do that together, they simply established Payom Chitko. All of the words, which is the most important thing that we sing, they're all out there, and you can understand each one. That's the, it, we'll do a lot more Chitko later. The only other thing, and, and I'll close with this, um, relationships between choir chords and reader or chanter chords. Okay. Ideally, if the choir is in this kind of a, of a harmony, okay, there's two good chords and it's two good notes for a for a reader to sing from this chord in the choir. Here's one of them. If you read, if you read on this note after this chord, if you read. Makes a lot of sense. Is that for Bozgosi too? too. Okay. So if we end in this, and the priest does, makes perfectly good sense. We can go right along. The other note that works is we finish like this, and the priest or reader does, and then. And actually, you do that instinctively 99 times out of 100. Okay. So, in, 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 uh, in notated form, if this is the chord, this is the tonic, that same tonic is a good thing for a reader or a chant uh, or for the clergy to use. If not the tonic, then bum, bum, a fourth down, or bum, bum, uh, a fifth up. It gets a little more dicey with minor chords. We're doing this. If we finish with this, then a good note is. That's a good reader good note. Or it basically what it what it does is if we're in a minor chord, one note down from the tonic, and then that same fourth or fifth from here, usually what will maintain a nice organized sound. Now this pushes all of the responsibility on the reader or the clergy, okay? That's this line, okay? What I tell young conductors is don't forget the other line goes in the other direction. So if your clergy is on one of these notes, okay, don't worry about being too pedantic to be exactly in this key or another. If you can, and he is reading on this, Construct your chord this way. In other words, go from him to a suitable chord. Usually, usually can be done. Okay. And the same thing here. Uh, a chanter, for example. The chord would be. So. There's your minor key. Okay. Uh, that that relationship from the minor to the chanter is is a very useful one. So here's how we end it, reader. Okay. All right, that's it. Before before I let you go, please no 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 applause. This is all for Slavic. Um,